Mrs. Dalloway in Bond Street by Virginia Woolf Read by Kiara Collin Dowgelly Miss Dalloway said she would buy the gloves herself. Big Ben was striking as she stepped out onto the street. It was 11 o'clock and the unused hour was fresh, as if issued to children on a beach. But there was something solemn in the deliberate swing of the repeated strokes, something stirring in the murmur of the wheels and the shuffling of footsteps. No doubt, they were not all bound on errands of happiness. There is much more to be said about us that we walk the streets of Westminster. Big Ben, too, is nothing but steel rods consumed by rust. Only for Mrs. Dalloway, the moment was complete. For Mrs. Dalloway, June was fresh, a happy childhood, and it was not to his daughters, only that Justin Perry had seemed a fine fellow. Flowers that evening, smoke rising, the cob rooks falling from ever so high, down, down through the October air. There is nothing to take the place of childhood. A leaf of mint brings it back, or a cup with a blue ring. A charming woman, poised, eager, strangely white-haired for her pink cheeks, saw her as he hurried to his office. Big Ben struck the tenth, struck the eleventh stroke. Pride held her up, inheriting, handing on, acquainted with discipline and with suffering. How people suffered. How they suffered, she thought, thinking of Mrs. Foxcroft at the embassy last night, decked with jewels, eating her heart out, because that nice boy was dead. Good morning to you, she said, Hugh Whitbread, raising his hat rather extravagantly by the china shop, for they had known each other as children. Where are you off to? I love walking in London, said Mrs. Dalloway. Really, it's better than walking in the country. We've just come up, said Hugh Whitbread, unfortunately to see doctors. Millie, said Mrs. Dalloway, instantly compassionate. Out of sorts, said Hugh Whitbread. That sort of thing. Of course, she thought, walking on. Millie is about my age, 50, 52, so it is probably that Hugh's manner had said so. She had passed through the Admiralty Arch and saw at the end of the empty road with its thin trees Victoria's White Mound, remembering Kensington Gardens and the old lady in horn spectacles and being told by Nanny to stop dead still and bow to the Queen. The flag flew over the palace. The King and Queen were back then. Dick had met her at lunch the other day. A thoroughly nice woman. It matters so much to the poor, thought Clarissa, and to the soldiers. A man in bronze stood heroically on a pedestal with a gun on her left-hand side, the South African War. It matters, thought Mrs. Dalloway, walking towards Buckingham Palace. There it stood four square, in the broad sunshine, uncompromising, plain. But it was character, she thought, something inborn in the race. What Indians respected. The Queen went to hospitals, opened bazaars. The Queen of England, thought Clarissa, looking at the palace. Already at this hour, a motor car passed out at the gates. The soldiers saluted, the gates were shut, and Clarissa, crossing the road, entered the park, holding herself upright. June had drawn out every leaf on the trees. Quite respectable girls lay stretched on the grass. An elderly man, stooping very stiffly, picked up a crumpled paper, spread it out flat, and flung it away. How horrible! Last night, at the embassy, Sir Digton had said, If I want one fellow to hold my horse, I have only to put out my hand. But the religious question is far more serious than the economic to ride, to dance. She had adored all of that, or going long walks in the country, talking about books, what to do with one's life, for young people were amazingly priggish. Oh, the things one had said. But one had conviction, middle age is the devil. A head grown gray from the contagion of the world's slow strain. Clarissa held herself upright, for she had spoken aloud, and now she was in Piccadilly, passing the house with the slender green columns and the balconies, passing club windows full of newspapers, passing Lady Burdett's house, where the glazed white parrot used to hang, and Devonshire house, without its gilt leopards. There was St. James's Palace, like a child's game with bricks, and now she had passed Bond Street. She was by Hatchard Bookshop. The stream was endless, and there was that absurd book, Soapy Sponge, which Jim used to quote by the yard, and Shakespeare's sonnets. She knew them by heart. Phil and she had argued all day about the dark lady, and Dick had said straight out at dinner that night that he had never heard of her. Really, she had married him for that. He had never read Shakespeare. There must be some little cheap book she could buy for Millie. Cranford, of course. Was there ever anything so enchanting as the cow in petticoats? If only people had that sort of humor, that sort of self-respect now, thought Clarissa, for she remembered the broad pages, the sentences ending, the characters, how one talked about them as if they were real. For all the great things, one must go to the past, she thought, from the contagion of the world's slow stain. Here was an open motor car with a girl alone, up till four, her feet tingling, I know, thought Clarissa, for the girl looked washed out, half asleep, in the corner of the car after the dance. And another car came, and another. At this hour of the morning, the excellent policeman would, when the time came, hold up his hand. Another motor car passed, how utterly unattractive. 
Why should a girl of that age paint black round her eyes? The admirable policeman raised his hand and Clarissa acknowledging his sway, taking her time, crossed, walked towards Bond Street, saw the narrow, crooked street. A hundred years ago, when her great-great-grandfather, Seymour Perry, had walked down Bond Street, the Perrys had walked for a hundred years and might have met the Dalloways. The river of Bond Street was clogged. There, like a queen at a tournament raised, Regal was a Lady Bexborough. She sat in her carriage, upright alone, looking through her glasses. The white glove was loose at her wrist. She was in black. And now, there she is, thought Clarissa, passing the countess who waited powdered perfectly still, and Clarissa would have given anything to be like that, the mistress of Clarefield, talking politics like a man. But she never goes anywhere, thought Clarissa, and the carriage went on, and Lady Bexborough was born, passed like a queen at a tournament, thought Clarissa, and tears actually rose to her eyes as she entered the shop. Good morning, said Clarissa in her charming voice. Gloves, she said with her exquisite friendliness and putting her bag on the counter began very slowly to undo the buttons. White gloves, she said, above the elbow. And she looked straight into the shopwoman's face, but this was not the girl she remembered. She looked quite old. These really don't fit, said Clarissa. The shop girl looked at them. Madam wears bracelets. Clarissa spread out her fingers. Perhaps it's my rings. And the girl took the gray gloves with her to the end of the counter. Yes, thought Clarissa. If it's the girl I remember, she's 20 years older. There was only one other customer sitting sideways at the counter, her elbow poised, her bare hand drooping, vacant, like a figure on a Japanese fan. Thought Clarissa, too vacant, perhaps, yet some men would adore her. The lady shook her head sadly. Again, the gloves were too large. They waited. A clock ticked. Bond Street hummed. Dull to distant, the woman went away holding gloves. Above the wrist, said the lady, mournfully raising her voice. A lady is known by her gloves and her shoes, old Uncle William used to say. And though the hanging silk stocking quivering silver, she looked at the lady, sloping shouldered, her hand drooping, her bag slipping, her eyes vacantly on the floor. Do you remember before the war you had gloves with pearl buttons? French gloves, madam? Yes, they were French, said Clarissa. The other lady rose very sadly and took her bag and looked at the gloves on the counter. But they were all too large. With pearl buttons, said the shop girl, who looked ever so much older. With pearl buttons, thought Clarissa, perfectly simple. How French. Madame's hands are so slender, said the shop girl, drawing the glove firmly, smoothly down over her rings. And Clarissa looked at her arm in the looking glass. The glove hardly came to her elbow. Were there others half an inch longer? Still, it seemed tiresome to bother her. Oh, don't bother, she said, but the gloves were brought. Don't you get fearfully tired, she said in her charming voice, standing. When do you get your holiday? In September, madam, when we're not busy. There she was in her place. Selling gloves was her job. The traffic suddenly roared. The silk stockings brightened. A customer came in. White glove, she said, with some ring in her voice that Clarissa remembered. It used, thought Clarissa, to be so simple. Thirty shillings, said the shopwoman. No, pardon me, madam, thirty-five. The French gloves are more. For one doesn't live for oneself, thought Clarissa. And then the other customer took a glove, tugged it, and it split. There, she exclaimed. A fault on the skin, said the grey-headed woman hurriedly. Sometimes a drop of acid in tanning. This pair, madam. But it's an awful swindle to ask two pound ten. Clarissa looked at the lady. The lady looked at Clarissa. Gloves have never been quite so reliable since the war, said the shop girl, apologizing to Clarissa. But where had she seen the other lady, elderly with a frill under her chin, wearing a black ribbon for gold, eyeglasses, sensual, clever? How one can tell from a voice when people are in the habit, thought Clarissa, of making other people. It's a shade too tight, she said to obey. The shopwoman went off again. Clarissa was left waiting. Fear no more, she repeated, playing her finger on the counter. Fear no more, the heat of the sun. Fear no more, she repeated. Thousands of young men had died that things must go on. At last, half an inch above the elbow. Pearl buttons, five and a quarter. Do you think I can sit here the whole morning? Now you'll take 25 minutes to bring me my change. There was a violent explosion in the street outside. The shopwoman cowered behind the counters, but Clarissa, sitting very upright, smiled at the other lady. Miss Anne Thrusser, she exclaimed.